and welcome to Dove Biology Bio Lessons to Go. In this lesson, we'll be examining the organization and classification of life. Now, evolution has yielded between 10 and 100 million modern living species on planet Earth. Now, in order to more easily study and compare the variety of life, we've actually put living things into groups or categories. Now, the science of categorizing and classifying living things is called taxonomy. So some of the groups that our living things are in would be like the fungus group, the plant group, the animal group. Now, humans are kind of, it's a natural inclination to group things. It helps us to organize them and to make sense of the world. Um, you know, for example, when we go shopping, we might go visit Walmart. And Walmart has a store that has lots of things that have lots and lots of potential categories. And one of those categories would be entertainment. So if we're looking for something in that entertainment category, we're going to go to that part of the store because things that are falling under that umbrella are going to be found in that department. Then let's say we want a movie. Well, that movie is going to be in another portion of that entertainment uh, department. So it's going to be categorized along with all of those other movies. All the DVDs are going to be grouped together. And if we want a new release, then we're going to like look for those new releases and maybe we'll find that movie that we're looking for. So by using like shared traits about these things, we're able to group them from like a broad characteristic to a more specific ca characteristic. So walking into a big store with lots of things like you might at a Walmart, you'll be able to then narrow it down and find that specific item that you're looking for. Well, scientists do the same thing in terms of categorizing and organizing living things so that we're better able to study them. Now, today, organisms are actually classified based upon a lot of particular similarities, the categories. And so the main categories that we use for organizing life are going to be the physical characteristics that they have, you know, like some of their homologous uh, traits, uh, their shared DNA, and any inferred evolutionary relationships that they might have, because we want to put organisms that have a more common ancestor in groups uh, more closely with one another than organisms that ha don't have that recent common ancestor. Now, our modern system of classification has um, a different levels of grouping. Kind of like going in, we have a whole store and then narrowing it down to just movies and then a specific movie. We have all of the living things and then we're going to start to narrow it down. So the broadest group that's present in our modern classification system are called domains. And there's three domains, the domain bacteria, the domain archaea, and the domain eukaryota. We then subdivide those domains into our next largest group, which are going to be kingdoms. So our domains um, are the archaea, the bacteria, and the eukaryota. And basically, they, they're put into these groups based upon both biochemical and genetic evidence. So things that are found in the domain archaea are specialized prokaryotes that typically are found in these extreme environments. They love really hot environments. They love a salty environment, some of them. Uh, some of them are going to be found in very acidic environments. Um, so they love these extreme environments. As opposed to our traditional eubacteria, these are going to be our typical prokaryotes. The bacteria that we might find in our gut cavity or the bacteria that might give us an illness like strep throat. Now notice that both of these domains include prokaryotes, uh, organisms whose cells lack a nucleus. Everybody else, all the rest of the kingdoms of life are going to be in the domain eukaryota. They're going to be organisms whose cells have a nucleus. Now, the domains themselves are going to be broken down into uh, further kingdoms. And currently, our textbooks have six kingdoms that are being identified. We have the kingdom archaea bacteria, um, which all of our archaea belong to. We'll have a kingdom of eubacteria, which all of the domain eubacteria belong to. And then our eukaryota have the remaining kingdoms. Those are going to be our protists, our fungi, our plants, and our animals. Now the kingdoms then are going to be further subdivided into more and more specific groups based upon shared characteristics. So kingdoms will be broken down into phylums, 
which are then broken down into classes, which are broken down into orders, then families, and then we have genus and species. So these are our, our different levels of taxonomy. So when we start to look at those, um, it's all about you know shared characteristics. So kind of like going into Walmart and seeing all of those uh, things that you could buy at the store. Here we have all of these things that um, have a nucleus and would be in the kingdom Animalia. And we start to narrow down to our different departments, or in this case, narrowing down into our different categories. So kingdoms are broken down into phylums. So who's missing? The sea star. Well, in the phylum chordata, in order to be in that phylum, you have to have a nerve cord, and sea stars don't have that. We then go down to our class. So it's a more specific grouping. And so who's missing? Our snake, because this is the class mammalia. Mammals have hair, and they have typically live birth and give milk to their young. That's why we say mammalia, because mammae, like mammary glands. Well, our snake doesn't have any of those things, so it can't be included into that group. So we go down into our order. In this case, we're going to go to the order carnivora. So who gets eliminated? our squirrel because the squirrel isn't a carnivore it's a rodent and so it doesn't fit in that category it's not going to be in that department then we'll go down into our family in this case the bear family and then the bear genus and then a specific bear which is going to be our grizzly bear ursus arctus now to remember the different levels of uh, categorizing and classifying living things you might want to come up with a mnemonic now, the one that most people had from like middle school was like, Dear King Philip came over for grape soda or sometimes great spaghetti. Um, you might want to get a little more creative, though, if, uh, if that doesn't jive with your memory. Like, for example, dumb kangaroos play chess on fine gold sand. Or if you're into the macabre, um, dumb kids playing chicken on freeway get squished. Now, the more classification categories that two organisms have, the more related they're going to be. Um, anything that's in the class mammal are going to be more related to one another than just any old animal because they have more characteristics in common. For example, you might see um, a chart like this that shows the classification of various organisms broken out by their groups. And you might be asked, well, which of these are going to be more closely related? Well, the ones that have the more uh, groups in common will be more closely related. So it's obvious then that our mountain lion and our domestic cat have a lot more in common. All of these organisms are in the kingdom Animalia. They're multicellular eukaryotic heterotrophs and they don't have cell walls. They all have a nerve cord, so they're all chordata. But where things get different is that our mountain lion and our domestic cat are in the class Mammalia. They have hair, they have milk glands. But our guppy is Asteichthys. It's a bony fish. It has a skeleton of bone. Um, our uh, lion and domestic cat are in the order Carnivora. They have teeth that are designed for chewing up meat um, that's specific for that, which our guppy now is not even in that same taxonomy. Um, they're both going to be in the family and genus of the cat, but what makes them different is their different species. And remember, species are groups of interbreeding organisms that can produce fertile offspring in nature, and these guys can't do that. So how did we arrive at our modern system of classification? Well, it started a long time ago, and so the first to actually classify was our Greek philosopher slash scientist Aristotle. About 2,000 years ago, he put living things into groups based upon their overall inferred complexity, like how complex they were. And he put them on sort of a ladder of nature with non-living things being on the basis. And as we moved up the ladder, we had more and more complex things where he thought that humans were perhaps the most complex. Now, without a microscope, um, he wasn't able to like differentiate into many different groups, but he could see the two big groups, which were like plants and animals. And in grouping them based upon their complexity, he further group them based upon structural similarities. Um, so like, for example, uh, a water animal versus a land animal. 
an animal with a shell versus an animal with fur. And then with our plants, based upon like the stem, so like a tree would have a large woody stem and like herbs and things would have um, a less complex stem. Now there are some problems with Aristotle's system. Well, first of all, it's not specific enough. Um, some organisms might actually fit into multiple categories. Um, for example, a bat uh, both flies, but it's a mammal. Or a cactus doesn't have your traditional leaves of a plant. Also, he was using the local names, that how they would call them there um, in Greece. Um, if we expanded out and started to talk about living things in other countries, um, they might get confused. Um, so his system really wasn't universal. Uh, for example, these two birds here are both commonly called robin. And if you were talking to someone in England about a robin, you're considering this organism, but they're thinking about this one in their head. So we needed to fix that. And so to fix that, um, we're going to see um, a gentleman come along by the name of Carolus Linnaeus. And Linnaeus is our father of modern classification. He decided to kind of fix things up and to make a better system. So first of all, he created a hierarchical system of classification that put things into groups based upon specific characteristics, not on some random inferred complexity. Um, things were grouped in order from um, least specific to most specific. Um, you'll notice that the group of phylum is not present because he didn't have that in his initial setup. That was added later um, after his death. So now we could identify this organism based upon specific characteristics. We know now that it's going to be a mammal. Additionally, um, to make things a little more universal, Linnaeus made sure that every organism would have a specific name that they be identified by all around the world a two-part name. Now he used the genus and the species name of that organism that was based in Latin or Greek to establish this uh, naming system. This naming system is called binomial nomenclature, which is pretty um, literal in its definition. Uh, by, to, nom, name. Two name nomenclature, two name naming system. So, for example, um, a cat, the scientific name would be Felis catus. When we go back to our birds, uh, the European robin would be Erathicus rubicula, and our American robin would be Turtus migratorius. The system is truly universal recognized all around the world. So here we've got a textbook excerpt from China, and yet right here in the middle of these Chinese characters, we see the scientific name for this mushroom, Amanita verna. Classification allows us to more easily study things, and with our modern system of classification, when two things are grouped close together, we know that they're gonna share common ancestors, common structures, and common DNA, um, which makes it a lot easier to study. And the fact that it's a universal system, no matter where you are in the world, um, you're going to be able to use this system um, to study living things.